I don't know if you believe this or not, but on Wednesday night, we have a great time in the Lord in our Bible study. And I'm always trying to encourage you to go beyond worship experience. Worship is great. <laughs> worship is that time where we come into the church and we give our praise unto God and we thank God. We lift up holy hand, we shout, we cry to the goodness of what God has done for us. It is that time that we separate ourselves from becoming ingrateful, ungrateful to becoming grateful on Sunday mornings. And so we jump out, out of our beds and we put on our Sunday going meeting clothes and we run to church to bow down in essence to praise and to worship him because we understand how good God has been to us. We are aware at that moment that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we have been? Have I got a witness in, in the house? You can give God some praise right there with your Bible in your hand. It's on Sunday morning that we realize that it is God who wakes us up in the morning and starts us on our way. The truth of the matter is, if the Lord had not breathed the breath of life into us this morning, we would have been dead and gone also. We're just not that good. We're just not that healthy. We're just not that smart. And so on Sunday morning is worship time. Say worship time. I don't know how anybody can go throughout the week without coming on Sunday morning for at least an hour or so just to praise the Lord for his goodness. Have I got a witness in the house? I mean, Sunday morning ought to be praise time. The Lord brought you another seven days and you ought to thank him for it. The Lord kept you in your right mind seven days. The Lord preserved your health when the doctor said you should have been gone a long time ago. The Lord kept your family yet in the land of the living and on Sunday morning ought to be the time to thank God. And you really don't know what it means to thank God till one day you come in and you find out that you've got a bad report. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Bad report. Doctors say all of a sudden you got an incurable disease. Ain't nothing I can do about it. And you say, well, that happens to everybody else. But it doesn't happen to me. No, that's not the case. It happens to the best of us. And so it's worship time. But on Wednesday is study time. Say study time. It's study time. Say study time. And we're dealing, we're dealing with a very significant and important subject on happiness. How to become happy. And in this particular study, we have discovered that there are, there are really four killjoys that kills our happiness. One of them is pain. Does anybody know anything about pain? I told, I told the class on Wednesday, you know, I was very happy one night. I was sleeping and having all of my dreams and doing very well. And one morning, then one morning uh, I got up like everybody else do and I just happened to hit the foot of the bed. Has anybody ever hit that? That iron piece, that sharp piece at the end of the bed. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, I couldn't be happy and pained at the same time. The truth of the matter is that pain is a killjoy. Say it's a killjoy. Not only is pain a killjoy, but I've discovered that every now and then people can kill your joy. I said time and time again, when you come in church on Sunday morning, you make sure you check out 360 degrees around you. And if you find that there's one person who is doing this, it's time to throw up your little finger and walk over to another area. I still believe that there are hot spots inside of the church on Sunday morning. And there are just certain places inside the church I don't think I want to sit, but where I want to sit is where I call the Veronica areas. 
you know, Veronica is that sister who works inside of the church. And when you call there, she starts to, instead of her saying, how you doing? She just starts to shout and testify oh. and witnessing on the phone about how good God is. And whatever complaint you had, it never gets to my desk because Veronica has already praised it away. After she gets finished with talking about how God is so good and he's a way out of no way and all of this stuff here, you don't have any, you've got to find some hot spots in the church. In fact, you ought to pray where you're going to sit on Sunday morning. And some people sit beside, you sit beside certain folk, they look at you as if, hey, you're on the wrong road. They got the whole road by themselves. <laughs> they act like they done bought the whole seat in the church. You know, if you give me the right amount of money, I will be glad to get, take that seat up and give it to you. And you can take it home and declare it yours. <laughs> but people is, 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 is in fact problems, okay? And not only are people problems, but also, uh, 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 what do we got? Pain and people problem. And what's the other problems, Larry? Anybody remember the other problem? <laughs> problem is a problem. And problems will always deter you from success and worship. You know, I keep saying to you, and I said it to myself as I was sitting there, you cannot worry and worship at the same time. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, Either you're going to worship or you're going to worry. But you can't worship and worry at the same time. You can't come in here talking about God is good and you're worried about where your next meal is coming from. You either are going to worry about it or you're going to worship God. And I've discovered on Sunday morning when you worship that somehow King Jesus rolls all your burdens away. And sometimes, somehow you feel better in the midst of your pain, people, and problems. Have I got one worshiper in the house? Can you do me a favor and just stand up for about 10 seconds and give God the best praise of your life? Can you stand up? Is there anybody here? God has been better to you than you've been to yourself. Can you feel that God has worked out? Somebody said Jesus can work it out. Can he work it out? Can he make a way out of no way? Ain't he a friend in an unfriendly world? Ain't he a mother for the motherless when daddy goes home? Ain't he a daddy for a daddy? For daddy, God is a good God. Can you just look up and shout, say, hey, God, thank you. Hey, somebody problem just went away because you said thank you. Somebody issue just went away because you said thank you. Somebody's concerned just rolled away because you said thank you. Somebody just got healed of a disease in your body just because you said thank you. Oh, you can sit down. But, but the question is, the question is, even in the midst of all your pain, your people problems and your problem problem. How do you get through that situation? If you read the book of Philippians, Philippians is the book of joy. Say joy. And if you have joy, you also have a semblance of happiness. Say happiness. Because even in the midst of what happens, you still have joy. And so when you got joy, it doesn't matter what happens, you still are going to be all right. What Paul tells us in the first chapter of Philippians, he's talking about joy and rejoicing, how you need to be rejoicing in joy. He said joy forevermore is that Paul is able to be happy in the midst of his problem in the midst of certain kinds of people and in the midst of certain kinds of pain. I wish I had some Wednesday night Bible study. And he tells us how he is able to get through all of these, these things by way of a jail cell venture. Can you imagine somebody being happy in jail? 
If there's any place that you ought not to experience happiness, it ought not to be the place of incarceration. And here Paul is talking about joy and rejoicing in the book of Philippians in an incarcerated situation. He has been incarcerated for four years. And even in his incarceration, even in his prison ministry, he writes some of the greatest books in the entire Bible. He writes a majority of the book, the New Testament, letters according to the Apostle Paul while he is in jail. And one of his favorite book is the book of Philippians. Now you need to understand that Philippi was his best loved church because it was one of his, his first church. And so oftentimes when we go through problems and trials and tribulations, instead of us thinking about bad things, Paul tells us we ought to learn to think about the good things. He starts to thinking about the good thing. He starts to thinking about his first church that he established there in Philippi. There was, uh, there was, there was, there was a lady there who was a, who was a seamstress by the name of Lydia. Y'all remember Lydia? Yeah. It, it is Lydia that he first meets in Philippi on the outside or on the outskirts of the town and he converts Lydia and also the sisters who are down by the riverside the riverbank outside of Philippi you know they were down by the riverside and they were having some other kind of a time but he introduces them to Jesus and the text says that becomes one of his best love church he could depend upon Philippi say Philippi Yes, he could depend upon Philippi because when Corinth had forsaken him, when Corinth had abandoned him, when Corinth wouldn't even help him financially, he could always depend upon the Philippian church. You know, you've got to find you some people who you can really depend upon. When you're going down through the trials and tribulation, when issues are in your life, you can't depend upon everybody. And sometimes you will discover, I'm just being prophetic, sometimes you will discover that even family will forsake you. But I stop by to tell you, God will always put the right person in front of you at the right time to lift you up. I wish I had two witnesses here. Some of us ought to have a resolution that we're just going to get rid of some people in our lives. Some friends and maybe a few family members. And so he writes this book on joy and rejoicing, but he has to go by way of a prison experience. He has to go to Caesarea, he has to go to Caesarea rather first, and in Caesarea he is in prison because of false charges. And then, watch this, he goes, he has a great dream. He always want to go to Rome. Say Rome. Rome. Rome was that place to which he wanted to preach. It was the big city. It was the New York City of his time. And he always wanted to preach at Rome because there were great people there. There was a lot of people in Rome. That's where the government was. Caesar was there. Nero was there. And so he wanted to go to Rome. Say Rome. He wanted to go to the Colosseum where he could preach to the thousands of people at the Colosseum. He wanted to be the modern day Billy Graham and so he wanted to go to the big city. He was tired of the little city and he wanted to go to Rome, the big city. But God said, if I'm going to get you to the big city, you got to go through the prison. Y'all better get that. Y'all better get that. Here, here, here's a point. I throw it out to you. Sometimes it's not about just resurrection, but resurrection doesn't occur unless there's a crucifixion. Y'all yeah. Yeah. better get that. Sometimes you can appreciate the resurrection when you deal with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. You can't talk about the Lord rose on Sunday morning without talking about Good Friday which was really bad Friday and terrible Friday when they crucified my Lord. You cannot talk about resurrection Sunday and appreciate what happened after three days until you start talking about how they beat him all night long, how they took him from judgment room to judgment room, how they abused him, put a, a crown of thorn of 72 on his head. You cannot talk about how you appreciate the goodness of God until God has brought you through the bad and the ugly also. Has anybody in the house been through the bad lately? 
anybody been through the ugly lately? And so he preaches in Rome, but he doesn't preach in the Colosseum. He preaches in a prison. Preaches in a prison. So he cannot go to Rome unless he goes by way of the jail cell where he is locked in jail between two, between uh, soldiers. But what he remembers in our clothes, he remembers one thing. And that is that when things around me are out of control, God is always in control. Can you give God some praise for that? God is always in control. No matter what occurs to us here in our nation, in our world, God still sits high, looks low, guides our feet wherever we go. When we don't understand, there is a God who cares. God is always in control. I told you about that last week. He's in control of life. It's in him we live, move, and have our being. He's in control of time. Time is in, is in his hand. He's in control of history. Everything that occurs does not occur without the eye, the ear, and the attention of God. And here's my last point. No matter what happens to you, we all going to be all right. Can you give God some praise? Can you give him some praise? He's in charge. He's in control, and he's never out of control. Here's the text. In 1 Peter, put it up there. 1, 6 through 7, out of the Philip Bible. Here is what Peter says. At present, watch this, you may be harassed. But the harassment, he says, by all kinds of trials, always temporary which means that no matter what happens to us it's got a parameter and a time limit on them that somehow God's going to work it out in his own due season that whatever we go through at present you may be harassed by all kinds of trials but the text says that the trials are always temporary Listen to what he says. He says, this is no accident. Say, no accident. no accident. The reason why you're going through trials and tribulations, it happens to prove your and my faith. I have never in my life, come on, stand on your feet. I have never in my life heard more people say, with the election of this president, that God is in control and that he must be doing something. We ain't talk like that in the last eight years. We ain't talk like that in the last 20 years. But now that we are going through trials possibly and tribulation, the Bible says they're temporary. But the Bible says it's not by accident. Can I tell you something? I know this is hard. This is hard for me. Having Mr. Trump in as president is no accident. All right, I got three hands. They must be all Republicans with me. It's not by accident because God doesn't allow unplanned things to happen in his mind. He already knew by hook or crook that he would be our president he said but remember it's only temporary 
and this is no accident. It has happened to prove your faith, your trust, what you believe about God, which is infinitely more valuable than gold. What God is going to do, he's going to return this nation back to him. Can you give God some praise? He's going to return this nation back to him. He's going to return this nation back to him. Folk are going to have to go back to church. Folk are going to have to go back to praying. Folk are going to have to go back to scripture. Folk are going to have to go back to studying their scripture. Folk are going to have to go back to loving their neighbor. Folk are going to have to go back to embracing each other. Folk are going to have to go back to wondering what God is up to. God is only drawing his the attention back to him. Let's bow our heads in the word of thanks unto God. Eternal God, we just thank you today again for your loving arms protection, for reminding us that sometimes, like Paul, we have to go through the prison experience in order to deal with all kinds of dangers, all kinds of pain, all kinds of problems, all kinds of people. And we believe even now, God, that even in the midst of this transition that we are now experiencing, we believe that you are in the transition and that there are no accidents. But these things happen to prove that we trust you. We're not going to leave you. That we are going to love you. And we're going to depend upon what we have read, studied, and heard in our Bible. God, we believe that proving our faith, testing our faith, trying our faith is infinitely more valuable than the purity of gold itself. God, you're going to remind us that you will never leave us nor forsake us. You're going to remind us that church is important and that worshiping you on Sunday especially is primary. You told us to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy and so this is our new Sabbath to which we are minded of the fact that you died on the cross but rose early Sunday morning. You're going to remind us that we have a covenant with you. And that is in you. We live, move, and have our existence. God, many of us have forsaken you in many kinds of ways in this nation. But I'm believing that we're coming back to you. And I'm praying, God, that even after Friday, that we will all show up on Sunday and believe that God is still good. Would you repeat after me this confession of faith? Say, dear God, I love you so much because you first loved me. You showed your love to me. When you sent to me your only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins, to be buried and raised from the grave. Say, God, I always need you in my life. I am helpless without you. But my community and my world need you also. Thank you, God, for not forsaking me, my nation, or my world. In Jesus' name, could you just continue in your private prayer moment for a moment as we come near to the close? If you're here today and you don't have a covering, you don't have a church home, would you be honest with me and just lift your hand up? You don't have.